Yeah, so we are recording now. Hello, this is a public session of the Join Pro study community. This community has been going for about a year. We have been studying Bayesian statistics and probabilistic modeling. We have had a couple of reading journeys with two books, and now we are having those standalone sessions where we, one of us is telling uh, about a certain topic or experiment or a data problem and so on. And today we have uh, David McGillifrey who will tell us about Bayesian hierarchical models. And uh, we will sometimes uh, at some points we'll stop for questions and, and then afterwards we'll have a discussion. And uh, this study group will have those standalone sessions in the coming weeks and months. And if anybody wishes to join us, then please, please join us and uh, let us see how we can help you catch up. Today's ses session will assume some background, some little background in Bayesian statistics. Unlike some other sessions, we which will be more of an introduction. So today, some background will be assumed and maybe in a moment, David will clarify that. And yeah, and looking forward to your talk, David. And maybe you wish to begin by telling a bit about yourself and, and then we can begin. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Uh, well, my name is Dave McGillivray. Uh, my background is in manufacturing engineering. Uh, as a manufacturing engineer, I've applied quite a few different techniques, statistical process control, uh, designed experiments and data analysis, but most of what I've done has been based on learning a formula and then uh, applying it without a deep understanding of the statistics behind it. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to get involved in Bayesian statistics, because it seems like it's a more fundamental approach to understanding uh, problems and processes. So that's basically my introduction. Um, what I'm going to do for this session is uh, I'm going to talk about hierarchical models. And um, I'm, as I say, I've been part of the joint prog group, which has been reading a book called Bayesian Modeling and Computation in Python, uh, which is available freely online. The other thing I should say is that anything that I talk about, all the links are in the notebook and there's a GitHub a uh, link to the notebook that you can use. But um, we've been reading that book. The target audience for this is someone who would have read chapters one to four of that uh, textbook that can build a simple generalized linear model in PyMC, can look at a trace plot and see if there's any obvious problems with the trace plot. Um, so basically it's targeted at someone who is a... Um, novice like me but not a complete raw novice you know that would have had to have done something with bayesian statistics so um that's basically the uh the introduction so now i'm going to share my screen and take a look at the notebook that i've got so maybe maybe david i'll just ask a small question so just to clarify about the background you assume in Bayesian statistics, I think, yes, it corresponds to those first four chapters of the book, but uh, for the friends who are new to us and who are here today, I think you are still invited to stay, even if you haven't read those chapters. And this session will be interesting and useful uh, if you have some idea of what Bayesian statistics is. And in the future, as always, please let us help and catch up together. Thanks. Is it right, David? Yeah, I think that's right. And I've tried to design the notebook so that if anyone is a novice, they can sort of take the notebook. And even if they don't understand everything about it, they can run it and play about with it and just see what uh, what happens. So, um, OK, so one of the things that uh, when we had a look at the Richard McElreath uh, sessions, which is statistical rethinking, that guy is really super keen on uh, hierarchical models and he spends a lot of time talking about them and emphasizing the benefits of them. So uh, I wanted to do something to 
get myself familiar with hierarchical models. And the way I thought I'd do it would be to find a model, uh, apply it, and then play with it and see what works and what doesn't work. So I did actually find a model, but it didn't turn out to uh, work. So this notebook is a journey from, it failed the first time I ran it. So this notebook is a journey of going from a failing model to something that works. And uh, the model is based on this paper, which is available free online, Bayesian hierarchical model for the prediction of football results uh, by Gianluco Bao and Marta Blangiado. Uh, and uh, in this paper, they developed two models. And uh, the great thing about it is that at the end of the paper, They've got this WinBugs code. I don't really know what WinBugs is, but it's um, you know straightforward enough that I can translate that into PyMC, which is what I did. And uh, I should say that the uh, version of PyMC that I'm using here is the, I think it's the latest version. It's uh, PyMC uh, 5.7. The other thing about this uh, about this paper is that the it it's, it analyzes data from Italian Football League, uh, it's called Serie A, uh, 1992 to 1993 season, and that data is also available online for download. So I was able to get out, get hold of that. So the great thing is that I can reproduce this and see if my results correspond to the results in the paper. So um, basically, um, as I say, this this notebook is a journey from start to finish about getting the model running. And the first thing that I did was translate the model into PyMC. And I'm gonna very briefly run through that because this is what the model looks like, uh, which is a bit different to what, you, what we see so far in the book, in the Bayesian modeling book up to chapter four, in that it's got this level of priors called hyper priors which feed into uh, priors here. There's 18 teams in a football season, in, a, in that football league, and there's 306 games in the football season. So basically the structure is hyper priors, priors, then deterministic, and then likelihood distributions. So first thing that happens, and I'm gonna explain all this a bit later on, but the first thing that happens is that I try and do this sample prior predictive and it fails. Uh, and all this is a direct lift from their model, and it fails based on this lamb value too large uh, associated with this Poisson distribution here. Then run the uh, sampler, and I get 1,544 divergences after tuning. And this is what the plot traces look like, which is basically all uh, these black lines for the divergences. So this is a terrible failure. The prior predictive sampler won't run due to the due to the um, size of the values fed to the Poisson distribution, and the model doesn't converge at all. So at this stage, maybe um, well, what I'm going to do is take a step back and discuss league football or league soccer, and then build a forward model to uh, represent what is uh, to try and capture what is represented in the Bayesian model in the paper. So I'll just very briefly explain about league uh, football, which is that um, in a season, there's, um, you know, in the, for example, in today's Premier League, there's uh, 20 teams. In Serie A for Italy, 1992, there was 18 teams in, the, in, the, uh, in that league. They play each other. Uh, every team plays every other team once, uh, once at home and once away. So there's basically 306 matches in a season. Teams tend to score more when they're playing at home. This is called home advantage, and it's a well-documented phenomenon in uh, football. Um, at the end of every season, three teams are relegated from the top, top league, uh, which would be the Serie A league, and uh, three new teams are promoted from the B league into the, uh, into the A league from, the, um, from underneath. Now, about football, football is actually a low scoring game with a high degree of randomness. I think in some of the American sports like basketball, it's not unusual to see like um, 
I don't know, like 50, 100 points scored. Uh, in, um, in soccer, you know, if you get six goals in a game, that's a big deal. That's a high scoring game. And um, people have looked at this, um, at the distribution of goals scored. I'm just going to jump to this web page here because this is what the distribution of goals scored in a match looked like. This is for the English Premier League, EPL, 2016-17 season. It's um, a web page by David Sheehan. And what he's done is he's got the empirical data for, pro for proportion of matches uh, where goals are scored. So, uh, for example, uh, home team is in the orange colour there. And the proportion of times that um, the home team score, didn't score any goals was about 22%. Uh, for the away team, the proportion of times that, zero goal, that they scored zero goals was about 35%. Uh, but the interesting thing is that what he's done here is he's fitted, he's taken these... Um, uh, empirical distributions. He's taken the mean of them and then he's fitted the Poisson distribution on top of them. The Poisson distribution is the uh, points, is the dots. And we can see that the Poisson distribution is a very good fit to the uh, empirical distribution for goals per match. So, um, sorry, I just want to see all my so that is um, that is basically the um, uh, the way that the likelihood function works for um, for soccer games. Just going to go to uh, this uh, distribution zoo, zoo here. I'm just going to pick up a um, just for the sake of anyone who doesn't uh, doesn't isn't familiar with this. This uh, this site lets you put in various values and then model various Poisson distributions. So there's only one parameter, which I would know as uh, lambda, and they're here calling uh, rate. And you can see that as this rate changes, um, you know, for, we can think of these uh, values on the bottom of goals. So zero goals, one goal, two goals, three goals. And, um, you know, so basically that's the uh, Poisson distribution. So anyway, so going back to the um, to the paper, the paper is actually quite readable. And when you read the paper, uh, you can pull out these basic equations, which is that the home team, uh, the, the number of goals that the home team scores in a match is proportional to home advantage plus home team attacking strength plus away team defence strength. Away team goals proportional to away team attacking strength plus home team defence strength. So you can imagine that for a very good team, they would have a high attacking strength uh, and uh, a very um, and also they would have a negative uh, defense strength because uh, if there were if a team is strong at defending, that means that they would they would tend to damp down the number of uh, uh, goals that the opposing team was scoring. So there's three inputs to the model. Um, uh, home advantage, attacking ability, and defense ability. Then uh, there's a zero sum constraint applied to the model, which is the subtract the mean attack ability from the attack ability of each team. And then there's a, a link function, exponential link function applied to these equations to get um, a sort of expected goals number, which is then fed into a Poisson distribution. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to build a forward model, a simple forward model. But at that point, I'm just going to pause because that was a sort of whirlwind tour of um, football and um, the uh, initial model. But I am going to go through in a bit more detail how the uh, how the model is put together. Uh, anything there, Daniel, or am I OK to, to go on? What do you think? Yeah, does anybody have any question? Would you like to maybe ask on the chat or with your voice? Yeah, so I guess you can continue. Thanks. Okay, so um, what uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build what I would call a forward model where this hierarchical thing, when I first looked at this, it's really difficult. I didn't really know where to start, because in the book, it talks about setting priors. 
have you set a prior for these things? For the for a start, attacking strength and away team de and defence strength, you can't really go to a football game and watch the football game and capture those as a number. I guess the closest you've got is something like uh, expected goals or XG number, but it doesn't really capture what these are. These are more like um, hidden parameters that the model is going to learn. So I didn't know how to set um, the, high, the, the values for the hyper prize or even the prize. So I thought, well, what I can do is I can build a, um, I can start with some numbers for um, attack strength and defense strength and build a sort of spreadsheet to work out what, uh, what values it gives me when I plug those into all the equations. So I'm going to start simple with the three team league, and I've got teams zero, one, and two, which is the team names. In a full season with three teams, team zero would play team one. Team one um, would take play two team two go two games at home and two games away because every team would play every other team once at home and once away. So uh, that's what a season would look like for a three team league, um, and then. I don't know what numbers to give the attack strength and defense strength, so I'll just give them these numbers, one, two, three, uh, and then same for the defense strength. I then adjust them by subtracting the mean, which gets me these attack strength and defense strength numbers, minus one, zero, and one. Then in my spreadsheet, I just um, map those um, the attack strength numbers to the particular team that they're associated with. I do that for the defence, for the home team def defence, away team attack. So I've got four uh, values here, home team attack, home team defence, away team attack, away team defence. Um, and then um, I put my home advantage as one because I didn't know what other number to choose just to get started. And then uh, equivalent to the... Um, you know, in the notes, it shows which is equivalent to the model code. Then I do these calculations to work out the um, the raw numbers, which is these, uh, right, home, you know, home advantage plus, um, plus home attack strength plus um, away uh, defense strength. And then end up with these, uh, these um, thetas. Uh, and then, um, sorry, then I apply the, sorry, the raw numbers, then I apply the exponential function to those to get these thetas, which are all positive. Then what I do is um, create a Poisson distribution where lambda is, the, is these particular numbers there. Then going back to distribution in zoo, if I set the uh, lambda there, then I've got this distribution and I make one pick from the distribution because I only get to play the game once, one pick from the distribution to choose how many goals are scored. Now, this distribution more than likely, if it's if the uh, rate for a team is 1.4 or the lambda for a team, more than likely it's gonna pick one goal scored, but it's not necessarily gonna do that. There is a chance it could pick five goals scored, but that's very unlikely to happen. So I get to pick one uh, goal, one goal value for these, uh, for the final value of the spreadsheet. And that's uh, basically my, uh, the way that the forward model works. So now uh, the Italian league had 18 teams. And I just want to uh, mention that some of the prior distributions in the original Winbox model that went from zero to 100 which seemed quite wide to me. So what I've done is I've pick, picked some attack strengths going from zero to 20. Now, the home team goals, when I work those through this, uh, this spreadsheet, the home team goals for game zero is uh, 1,976,000. Yeah, so I don't know, whatever, 19 million, whatever it is. So it's, it's millions of goals scored, which is patently absurd. So these numbers that I've chosen for the priors uh, are way too big. So all I did was just play about with them and come up with some numbers that gave me some goals that were more in line with what I would expect to see from a football season. So um, 
that's and basically it's not really a scientific process, but that was the best I could do to come up with some suitable priors to feed into the uh, hierarchical model. So when I when I reduce those to like zero to three and minus three to three, you know, and these are purely arbitrary, they're just numbers that I made up. I can then look at the distribution of goals that scored. And, um, you know, basically it's a lot, the distribution goes a lot higher than I would actually see in a season. But that's good because I don't want to be too constrained on my priors because I want the model to be able to learn from the priors, learn the price to be wide enough to the model for the model to learn from the data and adjust these to more suitable values. So, um, you know, these uh, number of goals scored goes up to 30, which is too, you know, that's um, that's insane. You would never see a Premier League, uh, you know, one of the top uh, divisions with 30 goals scored in a game. But uh, as I say, it's, um, it, it's a starting point. So basically, I built the forward model now and uh, the attack, and the, and I think that's explained why the uh, model, the initial model, failed to complete the prior predictive distribution with the lambda uh, complaint about the lambda value being too large, and I've established some approximate bounds on the prior that should be large enough for the model to learn from the data, but not too large that the sampler is going to uh, is going to break on the prior predictive. So that's basically the forward uh, forward model. At that point, I'm going to pause, and I'm going to ask Daniel if he's um... yeah yeah. So there have been a few comments in the chat, and both Dimit and Sandu had some comment about you know being thoughtful about the model, and I'm not sure if we can you know solve that now, but I'll just can I'll just. Uh, quote what they said. So Dimit asked, I wonder why attack and defense are additive and not multiplicative. And Sandu said, I'm confused why home team goals is proportional to away team defense strength. I'd guess these should be inversely proportional. Yeah, so I guess those those comments they kind of call for other variations on the model, and maybe one day we can try that. Um, yeah, or maybe you have some comments about it. Or anybody? Yeah, I, I think those are good points. Um, the the only thing I would say is that um, my objective here is just to try and get the model running the same way as it runs in the paper, because that gives me a starting point to look at things like mul multiplicative. Uh, models and even um, add in something like XG, uh, sorry, expected goals or goals, um, you know, sorry, I shouldn't say that because XG is a, um, is a measure of how well a team performs in a game. Um, uh, but uh, maybe a better thing to incorporate into this could be number of shots or some other way of uh, some other data that would feed into these uh, initial equations to uh, help the model learn from the uh, from the likelihood distributions. So uh, yeah, those are good places to go, but um, it's not my objective on this on this point. It's uh, sort of difficult enough, just seemed to be difficult enough, just trying to get the model to run and reproduce what was given in the original paper. But those are good places to go afterwards, I think. Does that answer that, Daniel? I think so. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so uh, that's the that's the forward model, and um, then the other thing is that um, when you read these books about Bayesian statistics, it always says start with the simplest model possible and then build up from there. But I don't think anyone actually follows that advice. I think most people just try and get started where they can, and I'm being flippant there. I guess that's the proper way of doing it, but. Um, you know, should take that advice to heart. So the way that the next model that I'm going to build is what uh, I would call an unpooled model, which isn't hierarchical. It's um, just got these uh, this set of prior values uh, built into it, and then a deterministic layer, and then the likelihood layer here. And uh, what this is, is that each team is just treated individually. 
So it just looks at the scores associated with each team and um, uh, tries to infer what the uh, um, uh, posterior is based on the based on those um, uh, based on those uh, on those values. So this is also a way that I can check that my prior um, my prior uh, ranges are going to be really suitable for the uh, for the model. So this is a simpler model than the hierarchical model. It's not as advanced as the hierarchical model, but it does um, it is a uh, it is a reasonable model. So um, if I run that model, um, I can look at the prior predictive checks. And um, the, uh, I'll start by looking at the distribution of home goals. This is before the, the model knows about any of the data from the 306 matches that have been played. And here in gray is the 94% um, uh, credible interval of number of goals scored in the 306 matches. And you can see that that ranges from zero up to about uh, eight or nine. That's good because um, I think in that season there was one um, there was one game where one of the teams scored uh, scored eight goals, you know, which is like really uh, really a lot. But anyway, this um, this prior predictive sample is and that is unusual. But this prior predictive sample is sort of um, good because it's wide enough that it's not outlandishly wide, but the model is going to be able to learn uh, using the data to narrow that down. For the away uh, goals, the, those are lower because the, it doesn't have the home advantage built into it. The actual number of goals scored is the uh, blue lines here, and maybe I'm a bit tight uh, to, the, uh, to the blue data here, but this is the 94% uh, credible interval. And the, um, basically, you know, I think those are reasonable uh, checks on the prior predictive. The posterior, the model seems to converge. I don't get any warnings. These, um, um, maybe there's a slight bit of difference in the distributions here, uh, but the things that I'm interested in, home advantage and attack team strength, seem to be good. The, the model seems to have been able to separate uh, the attack team uh, strengths. Okay, so this orange, these orange lines are for the best team in the league, the best attacking team. Uh, I noticed that the distributions tend to get wider as the um, as the uh, um, attack ability and defense ability decreases. Not sure of the reason for that, but it seems to have separated these teams into distinct distributions, which uh, is is good. And then the other thing that I can do is I can plot the mean attack strength against the mean defense strength for each team. And this plot is... Uh, is is good because the best team would have a good um, a high value for attack and if they're good at defending they would have a, have a negative team and i can tell you that in the in 1992 93 ac milan won the league and ac milan are showing distinctly that they are the best team in the league so i'm happy with this uh, this check then the posterior predictive uh, predictions uh, i took a look at them I didn't go into too much detail on them. All I did was look at the, um, take one of the chains, look at the uh, 306 games and find, uh, and from each of the um, uh, samples, find the mode, most frequent goals scored. Uh, and that, that was a, uh, that looked very good to me. The uh, uh, gray is the home team. That distribution is shifted to the right compared to the away team, meaning that they score more goals. But the goals tend to be, you know, for the in a sample for the most uh, goals scored um, across each game, those seemed suitable to me. So I was happy with those posterior predictive checks. So the model two summary: the model two was an unpooled model. Prior predictive checks look good. The model converged, and then the posterior predictive. Uh, uh, check looked good, albeit it was a limited check. But I didn't want to spend too much time on that because I was sort of dying to get back to the hierarchical model. So um, that's the unpooled model. I'm going to pause there, uh, Daniel. Anything going on there or am I clear to move on?
yeah, maybe let us uh, allow people to think for a moment and see if anybody is asking anything. I think it is very clear. Yeah, so I guess that is okay. So thanks. So this is. Uh, I, I realize that um, this is, um, you know, a bit of a ordeal, but I think that. Um, I guess this is just what I needed to go through to get the model to run, you know, and understand the model. So, um, as I say, this is pitched towards a novice level, and uh, that's what I'm what I'm trying to illustrate is the process that I needed to follow to get the model to run. So now we're going to go back to hierarchical models, and um, you know, we actually got reasonable results from the unpooled model. So. You know, we're, I think a reasonable question to ask is why would we why would we want to go to the hierarchical model? And for this particular set of data, I can think of two reasons why we'd want to do that. First one is that I mentioned that at the start of the season, three teams are relegated from the previous season and three new teams get promoted into the division. So these three three new teams. I only have data, if I want to predict what they're going to do, I only have data from the previous decision, the previous league that they were in, which is in really no way comparable to a top tier league like Serie A. So I really don't have any data for those, uh, those teams. If I go to the uh, unpooled model, the unpooled model is not going to be able to make predictions where it doesn't have data. The hierarchical model, because of the way it's uh, formulated and the way that it, it um, merges all the data together, is able to deal with uh, teams where there is limited data or there's uh, no data. So that solves the promotion relegation problem. The other thing is, one thing that happens is, say if I'm eight uh, games, let, let's say five weeks into the season, so um, each of the teams has played five games, you might have a, a team that has had, um, they have played a lot of teams that have been, that are very strong teams or are very weak teams. So the results of those teams are not really representative as to how they're going to perform throughout the rest of the season. A hierarchical model tends to, um, um, tends to be able to, uh, deal with overfitting so it is quite skeptical about extreme results i'm going to prove that later on when we compare the hierarchical to the uh, unpooled model but just take it from from me at the moment that um, it, it 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 is less prone to overfitting than the unpooled model and but in the in the paper actually the reason they use it is because it takes into account the relationship uh, between it means that instead of using a bivariate Poisson distribution or a correction factor, which is used in some of the other popular soccer scoring models, such as Dix and Coles, they don't need a correction factor as their claim because the hierarchical model um, allows, uh, deals with the issue of the, uh, of the likelihoods being, um, being related to each other. And that's the other thing about this model, which I should have said at the start, which is, Compared to the other models in the book, it's slightly more complex in that there's two uh, likelihood uh, functions that we need to deal with. So, um, oh, and then I guess the, the other one is a pooled model, which is the pooled model is where we'd have merged all the data together. That would have been completely useless because it wouldn't have allowed us to learn anything about individual teams. It would have told us about the average ability of a team in a league, but it wouldn't have told us anything about uh, the the individual teams. So the hierarchical model is, is instead of 18 prior distributions, we specify a hyper prior, which is then instead of specifying those 18 prior distributions, we specify a hyper prior, which um, is then used to learn the prior distribution. So this is the original model from the paper. The changes that are made is that the priors are narrowed based on what we learned from the forward model. The prior distributions in the paper, they use a gamma distribution for the sigma. I haven't used that because I'm not familiar with the gamma distribution. I've just used a half normal uh, distribution. And then some of the variable names are changed. So we'll just take a look at the structure of this model. 
which is that these are the hyper priors. These feed into the priors where we've got 18 teams. So these common distributions feed into them. So these distributions, uh, these, these teams know about the other teams based on these hyper priors that are fed in. Then we've got a deterministic layer, which is the same as the previous uh, uh, models. Then we've got our likelihood distributions at the end. So we've got distributions, distributions, deterministic distributions as the structure of that model. So the sample actually, the prior predictive sample actually runs this time, which is uh, a good sign. And uh, the uh, sampler uh, runs, but the results aren't uh, as good as what uh, I would hope to see. Because again, I end up with divergences. Uh, these traces uh, don't look very good. Uh, the uh, traces aren't sort of on top of each other. They don't look similar, so I've got these uh, R-hat values, which are too large, ESS, uh, too small. So again, even though this model should run, it doesn't run. I've got, uh, you know, there are some good parts to it, but basically uh, it's a flawed model. So what's going on here? Because that, uh, you know, basically I've tried to cover everything that I should have done. So I would love to say that I've been able to look at these uh, plots and diagnose what the problem is myself and then uh, come up with uh, what's needed to correct the model. But in actual fact, I've done what most people would do, which is go into the PIMC discourse and look for problems with hierarchical models. And apparently this is a common problem with hierarchical models. There's two solutions to it. One is to get more data. That's a non-starter because I want to compare this model to the um, results to the results that are in the original paper. And then the other uh, way forward is reparameterize to a non-centered model. So before I say what uh, a non-centered model is, I'm just going to have a go at explaining why reparameterization is something that uh, that helps the model. And I'm going to butcher this, but what I've got in the notebook is two links to two guys who are a lot smarter than me, Richard McElrath and Ben Lambert, who have got specific videos on problems with hierarchical models and what happens to the sampler when it tries to sample from them. But basically, the sampler, when, when we call the um, PyMC sample uh, function, it... Um, it does a thousand tuning steps as a default. On those tuning steps, it tries to set a step size for the sampler for when it samples the posterior. Um, it can uh, the sampler that we're using uses a fixed step size. With hierarchical models and weak data, the posterior geometry has got steep contours in it, which means that the which means that the sampler cannot, sampler cannot sample proportionately from those areas of the, um, of the sort of posterior geometry. Fortunately for us, the sampler knows when it's got a problem doing the actual sample and it reports that back to, uh, to me as a divergence. Uh, and um, if it, the, the problem is, is that because it's not sampled the geometry proportionately, the, um, the sample that it uh, reports back to me on the posterior predictive sample could be biased. So um, there's two links there uh, where these fellas explain, and in particular, um, this statistical rethinking uh, 2023 lecture has got a really good uh, explanation as to posterior geometry and why it fails. But the answer to this problem is to go from a centered to a non-centered parameterization of the model. And uh, this is um, what we have before is that we have a hyper prior here, which feeds into a prior, uh, sorry, two hyper priors here, which feed into the prior. So, so I'll just, um, doesn't seem like I can highlight these, but mu attack, sigma attack, hyper priors, and then we've got a pr prior for the uh, attack of each street of each team, which takes these hyper priors. The reparameterization is that those 
stay the same, the top two lines stay the same, but we introduce a standard normal distribution and then rewrite this third line here as a deterministic equation. So it's um, this bottom line is equivalent to that line in terms of uh, the, the mathematics of the, of the model. But what it does is it changes the way that the, the posterior geometry so that the sampler uh, can manage the sampling better than it can um, with a centered parameterization. So uh, that was, um, you know, I'm going to pause there. The next thing I'm going to do is run a hi non-centered hierarchical model, but I'm going to pause there and uh, but don't ask me any difficult questions about sampler geometries because I'll just have to refer you somewhere else. So what about that, Daniel? Anything coming up? Yeah. Yeah, so going a few paragraphs back, Katik is commenting. Uh, using a partial pooling model will lead to a team which is performing not good at all affect the estimates of the other teams as well. Does that justify using partial pooling? Well, I, I don't really know. And to answer that question, what, what I'm doing in this is I'm reproducing what's in the paper. What they do in the paper is they take a season's worth of results and they fit a model to the season's worth of results. They don't take the next season and make a load of predictions, you know, based on out of sample data. So uh, I'm not going to say that this, this is um, a better model or this is the best way of doing it, because to answer that question on this particular data set, I would really need to, to take the next season as out of sample data and run the, um, run the model step by step through the season, taking each week's games and then predicting the next week's games and then uh, see how the predictions compare to the, the actual um, uh, to the actual results. So that's a bit difficult for me to answer, uh, but I think that uh, the hierarchical model is, um, you know, maybe someone else in the chat is probably better answering that than me. But I think that the idea of the hierarchical model is that it does solve um, some issues. And uh, maybe later on, I'm going to show shrinkage, which might help get some understanding as to that question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and Kartik is clarifying. Uh, I'm talking about parameter estimates of this model only, not out of sample predictions. Yeah, and and yeah, I I think yes, if I understand correctly, later David, you will show a visual comparison that will allow us to kind of see you yeah. know after you fix the sampling problems. Uh, how how these models compare, and I think it kind of relates to what Kartik is commenting about. Yeah, so so maybe um, if if Kartik can just hold on until I get to, um, and I'll specifically point out the the plot to you, and then then that might um, that might answer your question or help get an understanding uh, as to where you want to go. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, uh, so now. Uh, finally, after, um, you know, I think I've been going for an hour now, uh, and I tried to, and I started trying to run this um, uh, model from the paper, and you'll be pleased to know that you're going to be put out of your agony fairly soon, because this model actually works. This is the non-centered hierarchical model. Um, just going back to the um, to the previous uh, one that uh, where the sampler had problems, we had distributions, distributions, deterministic distributions. When I change this model to a non-centered parameterization, I end up with distributions, deterministic distributions. So that just um, sort of illustrates, I know that's not really what, um, uh, you know, a good explanation as to how the, the non-centered parameterization simplifies the model, but even visually looking at it, it seems to be a simpler uh, model. So um, this model actually uh, runs, and uh, I get these uh, these 
um, trace plots from the model with no divergences. Um, so I'm happy about that. Then um, this is um, uh, the um, uh, mean predictions for the performance of each team and the home um, advantage. And then in the um, original paper, Uh, table two, and I'm not going to compare them side by side because I've only got two tabs open. But when you compare these um, these numbers to the numbers that's in the uh, that's produced by the model, they're not exactly the same, but they are in the same ballpark. You know, plus minus 0 0.05. So I'm reasonably happy with uh, with that. Uh, then when I do reliability plots. Um, and I won't go into detail on reliability plots, but what I'm looking for is these um, this relationship to be um, to follow this 45 degree line up the plot for home win, draw, and away win. And uh, there seems to be some bias in them, but in general, they do tend to follow that 45 degree line. And then for the Lou metric, um, there is basically oh yeah, this this is the other thing about the um, the Lou metric, which is that to to do this, you know, with a single likelihood, you don't need to um, tell it what you want to what you want to look at, because there's two likelihoods in this model. You need to give it this var name uh, argument, uh, and I do two of these to look at the. There's virtually nothing in it, so um, Kartik's question maybe you know I, I can't definitively say that one model is better than the other. This is the, sorry, this is the hierarchical model versus the, um, uh, versus the um, um, uh, unpooled uh, model. So I can't definitively say that they're better, but the other thing about this is that it also depends what you're looking at here, because if you want to look at um, these numbers, probability of a home win, then I think what you need to do is take the likelihoods for these um, for these uh, values uh, and combine them in some way so that you can do a single um, single um, uh, comparison for the um, for the Lou value. So to summarise the final model, I've got good agreements to the results shown in the original paper. Calibration plots show a reasonably linear relationship. Um, the uh, hierarchical model. Maybe slightly better, yeah, and that's based on these uh, Lou uh, plots here. And then with two likelihoods, you need to think about how to judge the model: goals, goal difference, probability, scores. There's any number of ways that you can combine those to um, uh, come up with what you want to actually get get out of the model. So then finally, and this is the um, thing for um, Kartik. I think I'm saying that right. Kartik uh, is. Um, I just want to show that earlier I showed a, um, a plot of the unpooled model, and this was the plot, and here I've labeled it non-hierarchical. And then I'm showing a plot of the hierarchical model for the mean attack strength and mean defense strength of each team. And something interesting happens here, which is that, for example, AC Milan, uh, they were the best team shown up on the, showing up on the um, unpooled model. All these teams on the hierarchical model, their performance is pulled back towards the mean. Uh, and the further away that the team is from the mean, the more extreme the value is, the more that the, uh, that the, that the attack strength or defense strength is pulled back towards the mean. So this is uh, something that apparently is very common and expected from hierarchical models and is known as shrinkage. Now, in McElreath, in his lectures, he makes um, he spends a bit of time on this, and one of the things that he says about it is that is that the advantage of it is that the model is skeptical of extreme values, which means that when it comes to fitting, when it comes to generalizing on out of sample data, hierarchical models in general do tend to perform better than unpooled models. Particularly where data is a bit scant and the data isn't, um, how can I say, it, robust or as representative as it could be. So that's um, 
that's uh, illustrating shrinkage. So um, I've got a summary there, but before I go to the summary, I'll just uh, recap what we've done. So we lifted the model directly from the paper, uh, converted the code from WinBooks to PyMC, tried to run it and it, um, it wouldn't converge. Then we uh, built a forward model to try and get an idea of how the model ran and what the uh, priors should be. We then built, and that gave us a good understanding of how the model works. We then ran an unpooled model uh, and that seemed to work okay. So that um, uh, showed that the priors that we'd, uh, that we'd estimated were uh, reasonable and the model was able to learn from the data. We then ran the hierarchical model that uh, failed, and it failed based not because the model was wrong, but because the sampler couldn't deal with the way that the posterior geometry was formed. Uh, so then we went from a non-centered model to a cent sorry, sorry, we went from a centered model to a non-centered uh, parameterization of the model, and that model ran and reproduced the results seen in the paper. And then the final thing we did was take a look at the difference between the hierarchical and the non-hierarchical models. Uh, so the summary is uh, there. Uh, maybe, um, you know, I'll just say they overcome some of the challenges, uh, such as unbalanced data, no data. Uh, it allows categories to relate to each other. More skeptical about extreme data can be a challenge for the sampler. Oh, and the other thing I should have said is that that reparameterization that we looked at, particularly applied to this normal distribution, where you've got running other models, you'll need to find the reparameterization that works for those particular distributions. And um, yeah, basically that's it. So that's uh, the reproduction of the model from the paper. And that notebook is uh, is available on the, the joint prob GitHub. Okay, so over to you, uh, Daniel now. Beautiful, thank you so much. Yeah, I think it was exciting to see methods in action and get a sense of how they behave and see, you know, that you actually reproduce a paper with slightly different software and algorithms and priors and actually get similar results. It's some part of the story. And, and then it is kind of this sense of robustness, which is so nice to see. And it is so exciting to see that you demonstrate what can go wrong and how you fix it. And yeah, so really thank you so much for this. I think what we can do now is that while we are still recording, some people may wish to ask or comment about something and then we, we can have like a little conversation. And then David, maybe you would like to conclude the recorded part and then maybe we stay longer after the recording and have like a, 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 another chat. Another kind. Yeah, so okay, does anybody wish to say anything? You can use your voice or or maybe David, you have some more to say before we go. No, I, I'm okay. good there, Daniel. Yeah. 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 So uh, um, anybody is invited to either write in the chat or, oh, Ryan, you have something. Yeah, I want to say thank you, David, for, for sharing that. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious, I, the challenge where I mean, you told this whole story, right? Where the, the model does not converge. Um, and then you you go through the different approaches and you we do have a converging model. Was that, I, I'm a little unclear, was the part where you got the, the model converging, was that part of the paper or was that your work and the paper left an unconverging model and published anyway? No, uh, the, the paper, the results that are produced in the paper uh, agree with what I've got on the converged model. But um, bear in mind there, Ryan, that the software that, that this paper was written in 2010. Oh, yeah. The software yeah. that they used was WinBugs software. And I don't really know anything about it, but I'm assuming that the, that the sample that they used or the way that it was sampled was able to deal with the priors that they used in the um, when they set up the model. Because of that um, geometry problem kind of in part two, right? Well, Does yeah, and, and I don't know. I guess that, you know, I've just used the default sampler here. Um, and I think that there are other maybe Riemannian samplers or something like that that are better able to deal with um, posterior geometry problems. I don't know how Windbugs did the sampling, 
it could well, have been a uh, default in, yeah, in but, Winbugs that wasn't published in the paper that Winbugs just used out of the box, but perhaps, yeah. Maybe. I, I, I don't, yeah, that, that's right. I, I don't know. Um, but um, uh, I think, I, I don't know if that Winbugs is still around, but, um, you know, we're basically, um, yeah, uh, you know, it, it's a bit difficult to answer, but but they, you know, they do produce good results from a converged model and I'm finally, after multiple attempts, able to reproduce their results in this notebook. Yeah, WinBugs is just um, not actively being developed. It's been morphed into OpenBugs. And OpenBugs is available for all platforms. It's not uh, locked oh. into uh, uh, Windows. But it's like the first um, Bayesian data analysis software that was really widely available that was real had a nice has a nice GUI interface and um it was a lot easier to use and the software that was previously available yeah so so their model does does work there ryan uh and are finally able to reproduce it in pymc using the non-converged hierarchy model Does that answer that right? A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. I, I, yeah, that was that was the the only part where I was a, a little unclear about the the difference between your work and the paper. Yeah, because um, if I'd just reproduced their model, uh, then the first uh, the this talk would have only been the first three minutes. I would have just yeah, run. Yeah, I, uh, I gave the paper stuff. a good good once over, but I, I didn't really. Yeah. Get memory. Yeah. Okay. But just to let you know, they do have a second model in there that you can work on if you're keen on doing that. Wonderful. Yeah, so I'll try to summarize what we have in the chat. So in addition to the thank yous uh, to this great talk, uh, Dimit is sharing a link to something called hot hand effect and is asking, I wonder if we can sample goals sequentially. And actually, Dimit, I'm not sure if I understand what you mean. So maybe you would like to comment about it, or maybe we can, if you prefer, we can continue on the chat. Uh, well, would you like to say uh, anything? Oh, hey. Hi, thank you. Yes. Uh, so in basketball, we have this effect of uh, hat hand, where, uh, where a player. Uh, uh, shoots a few baskets and then he, his probability to shoot another basket is higher. It was formally considered a fallacy, but it was uh, reanalyzed. Re so I was wondering if uh, in football we have the same effect, uh, both uh, with, in the same match where uh, some player uh, scores a goal uh, or between matches where uh, some team has a a sequence of uh, of uh, uh, victories, perhaps. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, I'll give you my personal opinion, which is that I think there is um, uh, the the way that a game forms changes the rest of the game. And what I mean by that is, some teams when they're playing at home, if they score a goal, they t they can tend to stop attacking and just go on defense because they know that they've got a goal, they know that they're in the lead, so they're not going to take chances by doing too much attacking. I'm not saying that all teams would do that, but that is my perception when I watch some teams play. Uh, and then, so that's the first thing within a game. For the second thing between games, I guess that one of the things that this model does, it takes a full season's games and then makes, um, you know, makes predictions on what the scores are going to be which is sort of really useless because the season has been played by then. You know, no one's really interested in what the, it's good to fit the model, but what is more interesting is making predictions on future games. And then for that, maybe a team's form, um, you know, make changes throughout the season. So maybe um, you could give weight into uh, more recent games than you would do to um, older games. Um, I guess you could just simply do that, do that by doubling the amount of data in the previous five games for a, for a team as you were going through the season. You do something simple like that. Um, so I think it's there, but I'm not sure how you would uh, quantify it and capture it.
Uh, so thanks. Yes. Thank you very sorry. much. Uh, thanks, David. I had a quick question. Uh, by the way, the shrinkage plot was quite interesting. Um, I was just going through the model four and um, I didn't get what are these offsets, uh, which is attack underscore T underscore and similarly defense underscore T underscore. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, I, I called them offsets in the code, but um, basically it's, you know, I, I'll leave you to step through the code, but basically this is the this is the structure before, and these are the this is the structure afterwards. And I think in the code, what I've called them is offsets. I'm not sure if that's the right terminology for it. I don't think it is, but I wasn't sure what else to call them. I was struggling a bit to, you know, I was just getting my understanding of the non-centered model when I was going through that. But basically it's just capturing these changes in the code. Okay. Um, all right. And and what does Z represent here? Okay, so Z is a is a standard normal distribution. So that's a that's a normal distribution that's centered at zero and with a standard deviation of one. So basically, when I look, see where my uh, mouse cursor is pointing now. I think I'm still yes. sharing there. Yes. So see that final line that gets rewritten with that Z incorporated into it like that. But the main difference is, and if you uh, watch- Yeah, 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 yeah this right. part again, yeah. So you can so do you, it with the standard normal, yes. So there's a uh, link to a video by Ben Lambert and he explains how it changes from a distribution feeding into a distribution to a deterministic um, mm -hmm. sort of um, way of calculating it, which helps the sampler. Yeah. Also, because the because you're now sampling from a standard deviation, like from a normal distribution with standard deviation one centered at zero, so it's the right. range is much smaller. Right. So the sampler so, doesn't have to. Uh... Yeah, and and here, if you look at this model, we're not feeding a distribution into another distribution. Hmm. Here we've got from yes. layer of distributions to deterministic calculations. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just curious as to, uh, okay, um, I think probably I'll just go back to the, um, that uh, uh, model three, just give me a moment. So where, so, uh, okay, I mean, I'm just, so basically because I've not read the paper, I was just glancing through the paper. I'm just trying to understand. So the data that we have is, uh, the outcome variable is home goals and away goals, right? Right. And uh, what are, so when you, when you create a linear model using the attack and defense abilities, attack and defense abilities are parameters. So what are the, um, uh, I mean, it generally has, so what's the input, uh, What's what are the predictor variables here? Okay, so so there isn't, that, that's what, uh, what this, the way this model works is that, let me just go back up here. When we ran the uh, forward model, um, the only data, the, the data that we used was, um, hang on, let me just, sorry, let me just go back up to these equations. So when I was looking at these equations here, Kartik, mm -hmm. the, these aren't things that I'm measuring. Home attack strength, away team defense strength, aren't things that I'm measuring. Mm -hmm. It's looking at the... Um, it's looking at these distributions of goals. It's then working backwards. Uh, and this is one way of, that I'm thinking about it. I'm not saying it's the right way or, you know, it's the best way of thinking about it. It's just the way I think about it. So it knows what that distribution of home goals is. It then works backwards and says, what's the most plausible values that's going to give me this distribution of 306 home goals? It then works backwards from that and says, what's the most plausible set of values that's going to give me uh, this, um, you know, defense uh, and attack strength. Mm -hmm. And then it pulls those 
values from the prior. So there's nothing that I'm measuring that I'm feeding into the model. This model is all the the uh, defense strength is all inferred from the uh, from the number of goals scored. So it's not. It is a bit different and a bit confusing to the models that are shown in the um, modeling and computation book, but um, I think they're called latent variables or hidden variables, but it's not something that's actually measured. I don't go to a football match and measure things. Okay. The model creates them. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> did um... that, that is a bit mind boggling, but did that, does that make sense? No, I, I'm just trying to think if 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 priors is all that we have for these parameters, uh, which are attack and defense abilities, then their posteriors also would be the priors. Because then how is it? How is the? Uh, no, I mean no, no, I was wrong actually. Well, I'll tell you. Yeah, I, have, a, have a look at it. See what you think. Um, you know, if you get the notebook and run through it, it might help. Yeah. Um. Yeah, you know, make sense of it, but th those are good questions. Those, you know, it is a bit of a mind-boggling example to to start with. Yeah, yeah, Actually, and it's different yeah. in this dual likelihood. You know, it's it's hidden parameters. You know, so it's not straightforward mm -hmm. um, compared to other models. Yeah, yeah. Actually, this would be an interesting exercise to do. <laughs> Thanks. By the way, we are now nine minutes before the official time. So maybe it makes sense for a few people to say some brief comment or ask a brief question, and then David will conclude the official time. Uh, does stop anybody sharing there, Daniel. Sorry? I'm going to stop sharing there, Daniel. Eh? Yeah. 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 Um, Sorry to yeah. interrupt you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so does anybody wish to say anything before we stop the official recording? Yeah, so maybe David, maybe you would like to conclude and say something and, and then we say goodbye to the recording. Uh, yeah, well, um, I guess that uh, that was my experience of running a hierarchical model. You know, as I say, I'm a novice. I'm just learning about this. And I uh, thought that the best way of learning about it was to do it and then share what I found out with the group. So uh, thanks for uh, your attention and the questions are good questions. Thanks very much for uh, listening. Thank you so much, David, for, you know, teaching us with so much clarity, as always. And uh, thank you to the 11 people who were here today. And we will say goodbye to the recording and see you on the next time.